What's up, everybody? Welcome back to The Neighborhood, and thank you for spending part of your day with us today. If you're a returning listener, thank you and welcome back. And if this happens to be your first episode, thank you and welcome to the show. On this episode, we're talking about Final Fantasy 16. Welcome to the podcast where two longtime friends and sometimes a guest talk about their favorite games from the perspective of an average player. My name is Andrew Kimball. And I'm Dylan Wren. And, and we, we are your friendly neighborhood gamers. Final Fantasy 16 is an action role-playing game developed and published by Square Enix, the 16th main installment in the Final Fantasy series. It was released for the PlayStation 5 as a timed exclusive. The game features segmented open environments and an action-based combat system involving melee and magic-based attacks. Final Fantasy 16 is set in the fictional world of Valisthea, a world divided between six nations who hold power through access to magical crystals and dominance humans who act as hosts for each nation's icon. Tensions between the nations escalate as a magical drought dubbed the Blight begins consuming the land. Clive Rossfield, guardian to his younger brother Joshua, witnesses his kingdom destroyed and becomes involved in the growing conflict between Valsia's nations and the secret power behind the war tied to the dark icon Ifrit. Naoki Yoshida, the producer of the game, said his aim was for a dark fantasy storyline that would have broad appeal and reinvigorate the series. Upon release, the game was well-received by critics. Praise was given to its story, characters, music, and combat system. Criticism focused on its lack of deeper role-playing elements, frame rate issues for its performance mode, and side quest design. This would normally be the part of the episode where I would throw it to Dylan, get his opinion on what I just... uh, described there but dylan has not played this game being the xbox fanboy that he is and also not having a ps5 just in general so i had to round up some fantastic guests and i think i did a great job getting these guys on the the episode here i can't think of anybody better we have joining me to talk about this game eric from the unlockables podcast eric how you doing Andrew, I'm doing great, sir. Thank you so much for allowing me back into the neighborhood. Uh, You and I got a chance to collab earlier this year. You guys came on my show to talk about Majesty, and we had a great time doing that. And I'm super, super happy that you asked me to come back for this one. I've been looking forward to talking this one uh, with you guys for a long time. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it as well. Uh, We also have Ryan from the List Off podcast. How you doing, Ryan? Good, good, Andrew. Thanks again for having me on, man. Um, happy to be here. Happy to talk Final Fantasy 16. And uh, yeah, definitely looking forward to this. Yeah, it's going to be, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. The way that this episode will break down as far as spoilers is we're going to keep them relegated to the back half of the conversation with a very obvious dedicated spoiler wall, probably some music or something from the game dividing those sections. So it'll be very obvious. So front half of this conversation we're going to talk about things a little bit more general top level not spoil the story at all and then in the back half we will uh no holds barred we will dive into it and then there will be timestamps. so after that if you want to come back to hear our verdicts uh, you can do that as well with that being said i kind of want to just start out getting everybody's history with final fantasy as a series for me it's pretty simple. It's pretty short. So I'll start. I feel like I might have the shortest history in the room. I've played 15, 7 Remake, and 16. Those are the ones that I've played all the way through. And then I've dabbled in like, I played one on my DS way back in the day. I played nice. uh, one on Xbox that was part of a, one of the like sequels. You know, I can't remember if it was 13 or if it was. I don't think it was 10 because 10 is supposed to be memorable. And this one was not super memorable to me. (laughs) Uh, So like pretty limited. It's mostly like the more recent stuff. So you could say I'm kind of a a newer fan to the to the franchise, but I've enjoyed what I've played. I liked 15 well enough. Um, Seven remake I thought was was really good. Um, But Ryan, I'm going to throw it to you first. What's your history with the franchise? 
Well, I think um, it's safe to say I am the elder statesman here <laughs> in general. <laughs> so uh, my first experience with Final Fantasy was with the first game. It was actually given to me as a kid uh, from a local neighborhood kid who didn't want it anymore. He was moving and he gave me Final Fantasy. And I, I knew nothing about it, never heard of it going in. And it quickly became one of my favorite games. Uh, growing up, I, I played that cartridge so many times, played through the story so many times of the original. This is the first one, guys. And then like any typical American, I didn't play another Final Fantasy till 3 came out for the Super <laughs> Nintendo. And I was blown away by that. Of course, that's Final Fantasy VI as we know it now. Played 7, skipped 8, played 9, and 9 was the last mainline Final Fantasy game I had played prior to 16. I did play the 7 remake and Strangers of Paradise prior to this as well. But really, I was everything Final Fantasy for me was more how the series started, right? Those early steps in the series. That's my, my fondest memories of it. And um, I loved Final Fantasy, the original one, so much, I used to make it a point to play it every year, to play through oh, wow. it. Uh, and I only stopped... I, Boy, it feels like just yesterday, but I stopped doing that probably a decade ago now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I um, I kind of moved outside of JRPGs in general after the 16-bit era. But as I mentioned, I did play some of like the P PlayStation era games, and then yeah, nothing really beyond that till uh, till this one. Nice, Eric. How about you? Yeah, so my experience with Final Fantasy started a, a little bit later. I entered the series with Final Fantasy IX, so the last uh, entry on the PlayStation 1. And since then, I've pretty much gone out of my way to play every single mainline one that comes out. So I've played 9 all the way through 16. Uh, I haven't played like any of the spinoff sequels like 10-2 or 13-2, 13-3. I just kind of stuck with the mainline ones. And then I've played a couple of spinoff ones here. So I've played like Type-0. Uh, similar to Ryan, I've played Strangers of Paradise none of the online ones so I'm, I'm pretty much just stick with the kind of like the mainline entries and then uh, i have gone back and played seven and eight so i've pretty much played every mainline final fantasy entry from seven all the way through 16 um with the pixel remaster out there's no excuse for me to not go back and play one through six and i'm sure that is coming probably within the next year i'll be be doing that for sure but uh ever since playing final fantasy 9 uh final fantasy and square enix games in general have just been kind of a part of my life i always go out of my way to try and play them because just the narratives and the story and the way they tell story and the characters just always seem to grip me and always seem to uh, like fulfill like my wildest fantasies and listeners of your show might know, be familiar with my show that uh, a bulk of my episodes are on one of uh, Final Fantasy's sister series, Kingdom Hearts. I have an entire mini series on my show dedicated to my insane fandom of that game. So yeah, ever since playing Final Fantasy IX back when I was a kid, it kind of sent me down this, this, path of Square Enix has kind of always just been a part of my life and their games that I can always go to to kind of just escape from the world for a little while. So when 16 was about to come out, uh, there's no difference. I was so excited for this game. Um, I'm a bit more of an apologist for some of the games that have been more critically panned, like 13 and 15, you know, despite the obvious problems that those those games have, I, I still uh, enjoyed my time with them. So yeah, love Final Fantasy, love Square. I I'm the Square apologist. I'm the Tetsuya Nomura guy in the community. That's pretty much what I've built my entire brand off of. <laughs> Ryan, you mentioned JRPG as a term. Um, these games are typically considered like RPGs for the most part, or JRPGs. This one, uh, I mentioned it kind of in the intro blurb, has been called an action game. Uh, it was had the most similar combat to like a devil may cry or something that any of the the games up to this point have had and i feel like the major sticking point or conversation or like around positives and negatives around this game were based on was it rpg enough or not and did the kind of like light rpg elements that were part of this game did they feel tacked on did they hold the game back should it have been like a hundred percent action i'm curious to hear what you guys think about that that whole kind of discourse yeah i i feel like it is what it is and i think that's what's lost here <laughs> i mean really like everybody wants the game to be what they want it to be you know if you're a fan of rpgs you want it to have more rpg elements if you're a fan of action games those rpg elements detract from the action but 
in reality, it is what it is. And like, we don't, we don't get a say like, yes, we could share our opinions, but I think we should really come to appreciate a game for what it set out to do rather than what we wanted it to do. So as far as the action and RPG elements, for me personally, some of them did feel kind of tacked on and almost feel like, felt like they did it because they felt like they had to appease two RPG fans because of yeah. the label, right? Because of what Final Fantasy has been known to be. But Square's always been headed this way with their last few Final Fantasy entries. I mean, having played the 7 Remake and Strangers of Paradise, it wasn't a huge surprise to me that they were leaning into the action here. And I mean, as far as whether or not it detracted from the game, I, I don't feel like it did at all. I feel like they set out and created the game they wanted to create. And they it, to me, for through my experience playing it, that was pretty well conveyed. Like I I think the action was good and I think those little like RPG elements were were done well. The one thing that's kind of irrelevant in the game was like upgrading your equipment in my in my mind. That's like the one thing they could have maybe fine-tuned a little better or a lot better, but I really I don't know. Maybe that maybe I'm silly for saying it, but like no. I think it was it was exactly what it set out to be. That was the one thing I was going to bring up too going off cuz I agree that it, you know, the game is what it is, and I thought it was a good attempt. Sounds kind of negative, but like a good step in the direction of like the mm -hmm. action genre. But I did feel like they could have maybe done a little bit more with like upgrading your gear or your weapons because that felt that was the most tacked on feeling thing. I really liked what they did with like abilities and being able to kind of mm -hmm. pick and choose and change up like that. The RPG side there of being able to kind of mess with the skill trees as as they were i thought was was a lot of fun and really added to the experience but not being able to i guess customize or improve your gear or stats in any way other than just number goes up and with the number your sword looks a little different i thought was a, a bit of a bummer but uh, i'm eric i'm curious to hear what you think about it yeah so i always try to especially when you're dealing with a franchise that has like the legacy and the fandom that that final fantasy does you know we have we have uh certain franchises that have this kind of divisive fandom uh, around them where people argue about you know what is, is this actually a game in in this franchise you know we, we've kind of had the same conversation with with zelda over the past few years about the way those games have gone i i, I tend to fall on the same side of the fence as, as ryan here you know i think context is important when talking about a game and Having read a bunch of the interviews and stuff that uh, Yoshi P did uh, in leading up to the release of this game, they were they were very communicative in what they were attempting to do, and they wanted to make a more action oriented, uh, like light RPG style of game. That's what they set out to do because, and this kind of goes back into Square's history as well. Like in the late '90s, when Final Fantasy VII came out, up through like the early mid 2000s, like. Square was this cutting edge, like tip of the industry, like developer where they are, they were always on the, the forefront of um, technological advances and making these, you know, jaw dropping games with these stunning visuals. And then when things kind of switch over to the PlayStation 3, Square kind of fell behind. And, and I feel like they've been playing catch up ever since. It's like Square is not that cutting edge developer anymore. They're just not. So Square's looking at the industry and seeing Sony having all these success with these like over the shoulder third person action games, like, you know, your Horizons, God of War, Last of Us, like, those are the titles that are really big right now. So it makes sense. And, and this is a sucky thing about, you know, things that we love as such as video games. Is it makes financial sense for Square to like make this style of game. And that's what they set out to do. And I think they, they did a really good job at, of it, despite the fact that you have this weird kind of dichotomy. At, like Final Fantasy, out of the, the three pillars they call it Square, kind of feels like the odd person out right now because... You have two other franchises that have an established like identity and what they do. Like Dragon Quest's main strength is its consistency going all the way back to like the 80s and 90s. Like it's it's very much like that classic RPG experience. And then you have on the other end of the spectrum, Kingdom Hearts, which is <laughs> by Kingdom Hearts 3, fully, fully leaned into like this action RPG style and and very despite the problems that I have with that game, is a very, very well fine-tuned um amalgamation of everything that they've done with that series for the last 20 years so now you have final fantasy kind of in the middle and it's like well you know it wants to be turn-based it wants to be more action oriented like where where does that leave 
Final Fantasy because they have games that already kind of fill all their other niches. And so they set out to make this game that was more widely popular. Unfortunately, I love a turn-based RPG as much as the next person. Um, that's what I grew up with. But I, I think the people that like those types of games are unfortunately kind of in the minority now, considering all the things that we can do with the technology we have nowadays. I, I Like I said, I will always, always, always love and prefer a turn-based RPG, but this is what they set out to do. And I think, you know, I have some problems with the light RPG stuff they just kind of sprinkled on there. Like, like you guys said, weapon upgrades, item upgrades didn't ever feel significant enough, like, to mean anything. Uh, they just kind of kept pace with, like, the structure of the game, which I felt the pacing was pretty good. But, yeah, it was a tacked on thing that I feel like people kind of expected. And, man, Final Fantasy fans, like, you're going to love it, you're going to hate it. And <laughs> every Final Fantasy game they come out with is either going to destroy the franchise or redeem the franchise. So, you're kind of damned know. if you do, damned if you don't. So. <laughs> I feel like a lot of Final Fantasy fans hate Final Fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most defining characteristic of the franchise. So yeah, uh, yeah, that kind of rambling thoughts all over the place. Uh, I they set they set out to do and accomplish. I thought they accomplished what they set out to do. Long story short, and it was a package that you know ultimately was kind of stuck in the middle. It didn't quite strike the balances between the combat and the RPG systems like Seven Remake did, which I think Seven Remake is probably the gold standard of how to balance an RPG system with an action-oriented system. Like, that system is absolutely fantastic. Didn't quite strike the same tone here, but I still liked it for what it was. Yeah, I thought the the action... Like, I think my favorite part was the combat, which, I mean, the game essentially breaks down into, like, I felt like you're watching a really interesting kind of highly produced drama-like show. And then in between sections that you're watching, you get to go in and fight stuff. And the combat to me was really satisfying. And that was where I thought the gameplay really shined. I, I thought it was interesting how like consistently they gave you like new abilities and stuff all the way to the end of the game. It was it wasn't one of those situations where like within the first few hours you have your full kit. It was like you kept getting new stuff, which I thought was really interesting. This game, I don't know if we've explicitly mentioned it, but it was created by the same team that made the MMO. And so I think some of the, the strengths that came with that were the story. I think that like some of the weaker things were like anything that wasn't part of the main core story and narrative. Like I thought that some of the the side questing and things that they did to kind of like slow the game down and kind of bring you down from some of these like really high highs because this game has some like crazy intense moments i thought some of that stuff felt a little like mmo-ish like you could tell oh, this side quest feels like very simple <laughs> very go get the thing and bring it back and at the beginning i didn't really mind that i was in for it i'm like i think i'm gonna just do all these because they're good enough <laughs> but then towards the end i was like you know i'm only going to do the ones that have like the little I, I can't remember if it was a star or what that was like hey this will give you yeah. something yeah, you know ones. i'm like yeah i'm going to focus on those because it's a it's a long game but it, it i don't think it overstayed its welcome but what did you guys think about like the side content and the i guess the even just the overall structure of the game as well was it an exclamation point? Is that what it was? I can't it remember. Might have been, but, uh, it might have been, yeah. <laughs> Actually, er Eric and I communicated um, while playing the game. And I remember we were, at first, we were both like you, Andrew. We were so into it. And I remember being like, oh, I'm doing every side quest. And Eric was like, me too, man. And then we got to that point later in the game where it was like, okay, we're, we're too many now. There is a specific point where it opens up to a lot of options, too. It goes yeah. from like a few side quests available to many many side quests available and um that was about the time that um i don't know if you ever went back and did them so i don't want to speak for you eric but uh that oh, was about i went the back time. and did all of them so oh wow cool i stopped yeah. doing them because i'm a i'm a psychopath so <laughs> <laughs> i can't the, leave markers unchecked on my screen i just can't i get it. it i get it if i would <laughs> if i turned the game back on i'd probably feel the same way <laughs> exactly but i have not done that but i i i think the reward for them for me, because you don't get a lot of uh, item reward, right? Monetary reward. Like you, you don't get a whole lot from these side quests in that regard, but it, every one of them did a good job of unveiling something else about the world. 
you know, something else about either the people who inhabit it or the people who are a part of your, you know, team. And and that was the real reward for these side quests. And and regardless of how simple or mundane the tasks were, which many of them were, like that is a very justified criticism. Yeah. Still, they did always show you a side of the world, like how brutal it can be or how much hope there can be. There was always something in these little mundane quests that that uh, I, I took out of it. And uh, that's why I kept doing them for as long as I did. Yeah, I'm, and I'm glad to you. You kind of touched on the the main thing that I, that I kind of took away, and something I brought up in, in my episode that I did on it is, yeah, the momentum and the and the pacing of this game is is incredibly interesting. It's one of the most interesting pace games that I've ever played because, you know, Andrew, like you alluded to, and we'll talk about more in the spoiler section. You have these insane, intense moments, and with these gigantic icon battles right like that was all the stuff in the marketing that was like what they're showing they're like look at this like you're gonna be like like giant kaiju battle and those moments at like they escalate and they they top on each other like one after the next after the next like each successive one you do just gets more like insane and those protracted moments of like insane action can go on for like sometimes like 25 30 minutes like it's a long period of time where you're in this heightened sense of like stuff is just going absolutely nuts and those mo- were moments where i was like literally caught myself like when it was over i was standing up off my couch like gripping my <laughs> controller so tightly and then it crashes back down into reality where yeah all of a sudden you know you kind of have these in between moments between these huge huge action set pieces where okay we're taking a breather now let's check in with like all of our people like what's going on in the world and yeah i don't think a- you could you could craft the best side quest in the world, but after the action you just experience, it's going to be mundane compared to what you just experienced. Some of them, yeah, are very fetch questy by design. It's yeah, go here, pick me flowers, find me potatoes, whatever, serve this bowl of stew to that person sitting over there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not, not super exciting. Um, but there are ones, and especially like you said, you were doing just the ones that were denoted by like the special exclamation point, which are usually a little more in depth and provide a little bit more rewards for you to incentive for you to do those. Um, some of those were were super touching and and that story that experience with the character like was kind of the reward um this isn't a spoiler but like one of the quest lines is to that has one of those significant exclamation points on it is to work with the blacksmith and you'd go and talk to him and he expresses to you he's just like yeah i'm kind of in a funk like i saw this other blacksmith's work and i just think mine is like crappy by comparison and like i felt bad for the guy because like that's a very human emotion. I feel the same way about the things that I create. I was like, yeah, man, sometimes I put out my episodes and I just listen to other people's episodes. I'm like, man, my stuff sucks by comparison. So just like that kind of a, a quest, like in little moments like that with the characters or something like I wasn't, wasn't expecting at all. So there are a couple of side quests in there that are like worth doing. And I think that add a lot of value to the story, but then yeah, they're, you can't have infinite number of those and they have to pad the game out a little bit somehow. So tried and true fetch quests. I don't think this game is by far the worst offender of fetch quests I've ever played. Uh, there are probably worse ones out there for sure. Um, some of the Assassin's Creed titles get pretty crazy with all the icons they throw at you for mundane activities. But yeah, it's it's a games of peaks and valleys and you have to know that going in and the peaks are very 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 high and the valleys crash very 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 low when that yeah. momentum comes to a, a halt. It is very odd pacing in that way. <laughs> I think something that goes along with that too is I felt like the um the visuals and like the art style was also had high highs and some not so high Highs, you talk about those icon battles or like the the pre rendered like cutscenes that you watch when you're like kind of I talked about like how I was like watching a high quality show, all of that. Some of the best I've seen in a video game up to this point. But then going back to like the slow it down, do the side quest for the the random guy in the village. That guy looks like a last gen NPC. <laughs> yeah. I will say at least they gave them unique faces in this game. True. Like yes. For those who have played the Strangers of Paradise, which I think are <laughs> all of us, right? <laughs> every every guy has guy face and every girl right. has girl face. And Except like, for Jack. He, you know who Jack yeah, is. <laughs> right. Right. So at least they did that in this game. Yeah. And that's been a problem too with 
that's been a problem too with with square games i've noticed as well and and again i hate to i hate to tie everything back to kingdom hearts but that's what i do and a lot of the kingdom hearts did the games did that too where like when you you have certain cutscenes that are like very high quality and when they hit like they're the best in the industry and then you have kind of these like secondary cutscenes that are scaled back a little bit that are like obviously using less resources they're not animating the faces as much like just the mouse are moving and sometimes the mouse don't even match up so yeah 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 that's a very like square the square is like all do, had done that since like the two like, they've always done that since 3d has become more more prevalent uh and i think we notice that more because we are spoiled with more of these games like you know every single scene motion lit movement in god of war is like perfectly animated there's none of that like secondary like oh cutting corners for that that type of game yeah and we're getting a lot more games like that so when people cut corners like that it's a lot more noticeable not that it's cutting corners that makes it sound like I'm no i was just gonna say <laughs> it's evident it's animated like it's not mocap right it, it looks yes. unnatural to us because we are used to seeing mocap now and like when it's something is actually animated by animators and and done probably quickly it's immediately evident as being like subpar in today's mm -hmm. industry standard right it's very easy to see where their resources went for this game. There's the giant battles and the, the, the key scenes. And something else I, I try to remember, too, is that uh, two years of this game were probably spent like making it working from home during COVID, I would I would assume, since, you know, yeah. Japanese Eastern culture, they're very conscious about being out during when they're sick and stuff. So I imagine they probably spent a couple years making this giant game from like their living rooms or whatever. Yeah. It, it kind of reminded me of like that thing in anime where it's like you can tell the the episodes where they like saved all their budget, you know, the big the big fight scene or the big the yep. big battle or the like <laughs> super impressive flashy episode of that arc. And then some of the other episodes, like the characters barely move, you know, right. We're having yeah. like three episodes of good stuff. And then it's like, oh, here's a 20 episode filler arc where we just needed to fill time and spend no money on. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but I don't think it was like super off-putting or distracting it was noticeable but like I, it didn't really take away from the overall experience for me um i did you mentioned it being like a square thing i noticed it in in seven remake too like you know you'd have some of these amazing looking cutscenes or like battle sequences and then you'd be like well there was the whole infamous door thing you know where the doors were just like oh yeah like just yep. looked really <laughs> off um but then like just npcs in the in the town and stuff just looking very like stilted and rigid and everything yes. um but they i think good environments though oh yeah they do yes. great environments for sure the environments are, are incredible and i think they're very smart about where they do put the bulk of their resources like they knew where it was important and i think that that shows and i think that about the resources thing too is like we have to remember that these big Sony games that have this high production budget value are like backed by Sony. Square Enix is an entity that stands on its own. So they are self-funded. They have to sell these games to make games. So, I mean, there's a little bit of difference. I would imagine that probably makes up some of the difference as well. Yeah. I could just be making excuses for Square though, because I'm, <laughs> I'm a fanboy and apologist. So <laughs> either way, we'll take it. So the other thing we mentioned the like the the genre, the action combat and everything trying to make it more approachable and mainstream and and a little bit different um trying to do something new with this entry the other way that they wanted to do something new with this entry was they wanted to make it game of thrones and they wanted it to be rated m and i'm curious obviously we can definitely dive more into this in in the spoiler section but just kind of like top level do you think that was necessary do you think it was a good move and do you think that it was game of thrones beyond the fact that like clive looked like Jon snow like <laughs> <laughs> he has a dire wolf too just he, he does, does have a, dire he does wolf. Have a wolf. <laughs> uh so I, I, did it have to be mature oh gosh that's such a tough question to answer right um the story they're telling, I think, I do think it helps. Uh, I, I do think it was um, maybe not a hundred percent necessary, but like they, I think they recognized the story they wanted to tell and and leaned in that direction and probably came to the conclusion that an M rating would help. There was only like one or two times through my playthrough where I was like, that ah, seemed a little forced, like an F bomb seemed forced, or like <laughs> right. you know something gory or 
happened. And I'm like, uh, you know, did that really have to be in there? There were definitely times when I, I feel like it didn't have to lean in that direction. But I think overall an M rating is justified. As far as the Game of Thrones influence, they put a lot of effort into the lore of the game. Yeah. And that's not always immediately apparent. There are, you, you do kind of have to do some digging, right? There's that uh, active time lore that gets a, a lot of praise and a lot of uh, talking points in the media. And I think I think it's cool. I think more RPGs could benefit from something like that. The fact that you could pause a game and when they're dropping all these pronouns you don't understand, you're like, let me pause it and see what they're talking about. And you could pull up a menu that will tell you the background of the very like places and people they are discussing. And and I, I found that helpful. Um, yeah. So I, I think the M rating, I think it benefited from it. And I think the inspiration from Game of Thrones is uh, is apparent, and um, yeah, I think I think it did a good job uh, with that inspiration for sure. I I agree with Ryan uh, again, and you know, at, you have to remember at the time when development started and, and when they were talking about this game, Game of Thrones was arguably probably at the height of its yeah. its popularity. Yeah, true. Um, a lot of people remember Game of Thrones because of the way it ended, and. That's not a that's not a problem with Game of Thrones. That is a problem with the creators wanting to abandon their project for more money. But that's a completely different episode for probably a completely different podcast. Uh, I think as far as like we have to remember that, you know, Game of Thrones kind of like changed television. It was the biggest thing for probably a half decade, five, six years there. It was mm -hmm. probably it was must is appointment. What must watch TV. So, you know, in terms of like trying to understand what fantasy people are into and what people are into. I, I think that's a, a pretty, pretty good, good place to start. So yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily have, have a problem with it. Uh, I will defend game of Thrones for like the first six seasons, seven and eight are bad. That's, that's it is right, what it look, is at Eric, this point. <laughs> we can't have this conversation. <laughs> I love game uh, of it, Thrones. I think sevens are like, it was, it was all right. Yeah. It was it was clearly rushed towards the, the, the conclusion. Yes. Absolutely. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and I think too, uh, one of Thrones' greatest strengths uh, with how that show is rated and how much brutality they show is that like the violence is a little bit off putting and uncomfortable sometimes, but it really does hammer home like the brutality of that world that they live in. And I think when crafting a story that's kind of related to that, especially for your Final Fantasy game, a violence can be an effective tool to kind of hammer home how brutal that world is because it, re it really is it's a it's a very brutal world from you know you have bears of people that can use magic are, are basically enslaved and you know people that uh, aren't basically like the high born elite are you know kind of just treated very very badly so i, I think in, in certain it makes sense to 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 use violence to kind of to, to hammer that home and, and it was something that i didn't i wasn't really bothered by uh, as far as doing things like, you know, showing some nudity and maybe like some sex scenes here and there, kind of like implying that, I, I think it's interesting that, you know, they were at least willing to try and like take on like more established romance between characters. I'm like, yeah, these characters probably like would be boning. I mean, that makes sense. That's a human yeah, emotion. People That's do a human it. Thing. Yeah, people <laughs> do it. Yeah. We don't need to be what? ashamed of that. Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> so I, I think that's that's interesting, like whether or not it was effective in the story. I don't know enough about like romance or any or relationships. Or anything like that like, <laughs> you heard like, it here. I, I'm guess knows enough, nothing about listen, romance. <laughs> am I, I'm lucky enough to have like tricked my wife into staying with me. I don't know. I don't know anything. So but I, I think I like the inspiration from Thrones. That didn't bother me. And and like Ryan said, he hit on the lore. The the active time lore system is like again you guys know me i'm a i'm a lore junkie fiend like that is the point of my kingdom hearts is just like yeah. i love the lore so i found myself like it, it probably took me longer to play the game because of this but i found myself like every three or four minutes like opening the active time lore during a cutscene and seeing like okay is there any more information mm. is there anything new that's been revealed because and by the end of the the game i kind of felt because of that system i had a deeper appreciation for the story that was told because I was able to access extra information about it whenever I, I wanted to. And I think that was a, a very cool aspect of the game, a very uh, underrated, but I think people understand and praise that, that aspect of the game uh, adequately because yeah, that was, that was very, very cool. Even though it was born out of necessity where like the developers were like, we have no idea what's going on. Like, how do we keep track of this? Yeah. But 
but in the end, I, I, that's such a cool thing for games to be able to do. I was just thinking like other games I play, if I was able to just like the have deeper lore, if I was able to just stop and like maybe just like read a couple paragraphs and like some stuff that was going on, I think my appreciation would be even greater for for the story that they were trying to tell. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I refuse to believe you know nothing about romance, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> we we all know that Eric is overly modest about everything. So like luck is part of romance, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> there's probably some truth to that. I think about like my first time playing The Witcher 3, and if it had had something like the active time lore, like how helpful that would have been, just oh, understanding yeah. what is happening in that world, especially being like the third game in the series. I think what made me come up with this question about like was the m necessary or justified was their inspiration is game of thrones a show where like you literally see somebody like shove their thumbs into somebody else's eye sockets you know like it's oh yeah it's oh, like god it, it's brutal right <laughs> not, not that scene and that's no. <laughs> that's one of like many things that happens in that show and if you watch house of dragons like that shows arguably oh, more intense i think and yeah. so <laughs> yeah after one season <laughs> i kind of felt like this game was very uh, restrained in like how it showed the violence and how it showed like sex. There was no real like, and I'm not saying it's necessary, but there was no like full on nudity like we've mentioned or whatever. Like it was all very restrained and tasteful. And I don't think that's a bad thing, but like when they were bragging about this or not necessarily bragging, but like in the marketing leading up to it, it was like, this is game of Thrones inspired. It's the first M rated final fantasy game. Like, I was kind this of not your dad's final fantasy. Exactly. I was kind of <laughs> caught off guard a little bit by like how restrained they final were. Fantasy for cool kids. <laughs> like sometimes I would turn the corner and like you're the characters are talking like they're about to witness this like really messed up stuff when they get to the end of this hallway or whatever. And then you get there and it's like, yeah, there's a, a dead body on an altar or something. But like it, you've seen that. Before. Yeah, it's not like something <laughs> extremely brutal. And I'm again, I'm not saying that that's required. But I just was kind of like, it's kind of sparked that question. The longer I played the game and the more I realized like this is going to be like the whole experience. I was like, did they really need to go M? Because I mean, that does alienate some players. I mean, granted, people mm -hmm. that want to play ultimately are going to get their hands on it. But so that was just kind of a, like the angle I was coming from thinking about that that question. Yeah, I feel like that's a good point because then really if they only did it for the the language that's the point that felt forced to mm -hmm. me right right so like yeah you bring up a good point was it necessary i mean i want to see cloud drop some f-bombs in the next seven remake part <laughs> two. like just yeah. let them let them let a couple fly no and i think andrew you bring up a good point too whereas you know we, we just talked about in the beginning that this game's purpose was to reach like a wider audience but with an m rating you're gonna potentially restrict reaching that wider audience because people under the age of 18 aren't going to be able to play it so it's, it's kind of an inter interesting point. I also I mean, think are too, they though? Like you can buy yeah. things digitally. Who at GameStop yeah, is right. going? Can I see your ID? <laughs> That's fair. That's yeah. fair. Yeah, people don't shop in real stores anymore. It's all online, <laughs> right? And I, I think too that uh, probably I, I try to think of it. You know, we think of, of a lot about our analysis of video games from a very like a marrow centric point of view. Japanese culture, I feel, is like a little bit more reserved. So probably the things that they put out probably is an M rating over in their culture. And I say that, but then, you know, we get some like really weird shit that happens in like anime sometimes. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. Or if you look I at the Nintendo eShop or the like PlayStation store, like some <laughs> like, of the games. Battle that Royale come in there. is a movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Wife Who Discovered too. I mean, you got that. <laughs> so I, I mean, I, I thought it was fine. M rating. Yeah, that's fine. I'm a, I'm a big boy. I can see. I can handle it. <laughs> yeah, it, I didn't like it didn't affect it didn't uh, negatively impact me. And honestly, like as a parent with small children in the house, like I was not upset that this game wasn't like overly egregious with stuff. Not that I was like actively playing it in front of my four year old, but like those things stand out to me more in games now. And when they feel forced or egregious, like that can turn oh, yeah. me off, like trying to play uh, mm -hmm. atomic heart or something earlier this year, where it's just like, so over the top with, with some of that stuff. It's like, man, it's just, it's like, it sticks out like a sore thumb to me now. So like, honestly, I was kind of like, I found it kind of refreshing, but it did just kind of stick in my mind of like, this was such a big deal leading up to this game. And I'm kind of curious of like, why? you know, but right. it's more just something to ponder. I don't think obviously we'll ever really fully be able to get to the, the core truth of it, but it, it was something that I thought 
on the gameplay side again on the performance side and this is something we don't have to talk about for very long but they had to patch in a motion blur toggle uh after the game came out this game had some of the most upsetting motion blur <laughs> that i i've had to deal with on in like a game and and usually it's n- that's not something that like stands out to me too much i'm not like a pc gamer uh but man when you move the camera in this game it was like whoa I don't know if either of you guys noticed that. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I am not a PC gamer, but I am, you know, I know there's a lot of conversation about like frames per second right now, even in the console space. Yeah. And there are a lot of like FPS snobs, right? And like, I would never play a 30 FPS game. <laughs> like I'll, I'll play a game regardless, but yeah, there is a notable difference between 60 and 30. And that sort of motion blur is exactly what comes to mind with those differences. Like, oh, it, it's bad. It was very bad. And um, I think you actually let me know when they put the slider out, uh, Andrew. Yeah. And I was like, thank God yeah. this happened. And uh, it definitely made a difference. I was very happy for that update. I think, I, I believe that was most prevalent when you had like the performance mode on. Was that correct? When you're getting the, the highest frame rate and kind of stuff like that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. I had that on for a little bit, and yeah, I was like, man, I just, I can't play it like this. I, I can't. So I switched back to the quality mode and proceeded to, to play the rest of the game like that. And oh. I thought, like, yeah, this looks, this looks fine. Uh, also because, too, when I was playing it, like, right off the bat, I read that, like, you should play it on the quality mode because the performance mode had some, like, tearing issues at, at the start oh. before, they, before they patched it. And so I just switched back to quality mode because there were some, like, little tears and, and, and things of, like, environments, like, peeking through. And so I switched back to quality mode, and then when they patched it, I just don't think I ever switched back because I just got used to it, and I was just like, "Yeah, that's fine." So, um, but yeah, I the the couple hours I did play it in in performance mode, like by the approaching like the third hour, I was sitting there and playing it. I was like, "Man, like I got a I got a headache. Like this usually doesn't like doesn't happen." But yeah, it was yeah. If you're whipping that camera around, which which you are a lot because you're, you're in battle, you're whipping the camera all over the place or looking around at your surroundings. Yeah, it gave me gave me quite the headache. Yeah. It was it was brutal. I'm glad that they addressed it relatively quickly. Like I hadn't beaten the game yes. by the time they addressed it, which was which was nice. So the, the last thing that I want to touch on before we move into spoilers, and this is uh, kind of leading into spoilers. Uh, obviously, there will still be a very distinct break, but story, characters, things like that. Um, obviously, kind of keeping it top level here. What did you guys think of? the story of this game you've already kind of mentioned the setup about like dealing with slavery like people born as bearers having like magic abilities are are kind of cast aside and seen as second class citizens put into slavery um and so there's all that then there's the mentioned the icons so like every nation has somebody with the ability to turn into essentially like a magical kaiju which they kind of use as like their nuclear uh weapon so that kind of adds this new layer to warfare i thought that was a really interesting kind of twist on the the fantasy warfare genre so what did you guys think of the the kind of setup the world the the character's story of this game so i thought there was a lot of depth to the world they did a good job with that Uh, a lot of um a lot to un, un, unfurl as you play about like w- people's place in the world, yeah. not just you know Clive and the main characters, but everybody and how that how the different societies work and interact. I expected more intrigue, like that sort of Game of Thrones yeah. from the and they alluded to it from the very get go, right? And I was like, oh, this is going to be good. They're they're definitely going to have some like you know warring nations. You're going to have like your little fingers of the world and things like that. It, totally did not go that route I, I that disappointed me yeah. a little bit overall i think it has a lull in the middle i think the story suffers in that middle section of the game i think the beginning was excellent you're you're figuring everything out and it, it felt new it felt fresh and the end part of the story i thought that last third act was just phenomenal but there is a section in the middle where you're going to be doing those mundane side quests and there's not a whole lot happening and you're going to feel like there's maybe too long between story points, like major story points. Well, I, I shouldn't assume people will feel that way, but that is definitely how I felt. Yeah. So, but as a whole, I think the story was great. I'm very happy to have played through it. 
I, I just think there is critic there are criticisms to be made there. I'm again, uh, Brian and I, we are on the exact same page. Uh, I, I wrote as much in my, in my episode, I said the same thing. They, first of all, the, the first couple hours of this game, which they make available for the demo is oh yeah fantastic. It may be the best demo I've like ever played. Like it, I remember when we when we all played it and everybody was talking in the Discord, we were just like, "Did you guys play the 16 demo?" We were like all blown away by it. Hype, like it, yeah, yeah, it was really good. Um, but yes, Ryan hit the nail on the head. Like they had this Game of Thrones esque world like set up, and through like some of the active time lore and stuff, you read that like, oh, these like nations are at war. Like these people are against like these people for like these reasons. And there was a lot of opportunity there for like you could be like, oh, people could like ally with each other. People could betray each other. There could have been like all this like literal like politicking and like chess moves and all this stuff. And I was really excited for that. Cause like, it was like, it was like right there for them to be able to do that. And then Ryan is exactly right. Like when you get to about the halfway point in the story, it kind of like takes a lull and the half, and this game is very much a, a game of like two sides of that story. And it's very final fantasy in the way it presents it. Right. Every final fantasy game has this like first part that they tell it, that's this story. And then when it wraps up towards like the back half of the game, it switches to that, classic final fantasy episode or story right there's a there's like a crazy twist and then all of a sudden like the world is in grave peril and we're like we're we're fighting god like it's it makes that final fantasy turn that every game has done in the entire series and about the halfway point of that game that's when it starts to transition to that that final fantasy aspect of of the story and i think like ryan said when we get to that third act and get to like that full like we've left the politic in game of thrones behind we get to that that final fantasy part of the story like I fucking, sorry, my language. I live for that. I live for it. Like, that's why I love Kingdom Hearts. That's why I love Final Fantasy. I love that, like, all this crazy stuff is going on. And, like, we have to, like, literally fight God. Like, sign me up. Love it. That's great. But <laughs> the, the turn it takes to get from, like, that Game of Thrones part of the story to, like, the Final Fantasy part of the story, it's a really wide turn in the middle of that slow middle that, that Ryan alluded to. So, you know... It, it, I think it's great. And I even like in my episode, again, I said that I would have loved to have seen just a little more like political intrigue and like just interaction between like the different nations and people of the, of the world and stuff. Cause they like set that up and a lot of the characters are, are really, are really great and written really well. And I think there would have been, and there's some that you just want to really hate that we'll get into that. I have, I have a couple people I need to call out cause they're just so awful that you, there's so well-written, terrible characters that you just want to like, you, you, they're like King, they're like Joffrey in Game of Thrones. Like you just love to hate him, right? But yeah, by, by the time I got through with it, I was just like, yep, this delivered everything I could have asked for in a Final Fantasy story. Like, took me through those loops, had those awesome twists, uh, had those heartbreaking moments, and, you know, delivered a, a, a fantastic ending that is relatively open to interpretation. Yeah, that's, I felt the exact same way, except I was hoping it would stay Game of Thrones for longer. And I think a lot of it was because, like what Ryan said, the promise of Game of Thrones is the promise of all of this, like politics and backstabbing and right. twists and turns and stuff. And, you know, we saw a little bit of that with like Dion and his story. But for the right. most part, like it set up all the kind of Game of Thrones, like fantasy political drama stuff in the beginning. And then it started, it kind of, it followed a pretty linear path. And then, like you said, about halfway through, it became like just a full blown Final Fantasy like experience, which was done really <laughs> well, and it was definitely wasn't bad. And I I agree. I think that like visually and and everything that's happening in like the back half of the game is is great. But I was kind of hoping for a little bit more of that Game of Thrones like political stuff, and also just like the warring nations, people switching sides, like just. A little bit more grounded, maybe, which sounds silly to say in in this universe, but we got what we got, and I thought it was good. But I, as we started to make that wide turn, I was like, "Oh, I I see where we're going with this. I I, right. I, I got it." Maybe it's uh, maybe what we're missing is it's actually a master class in roping people into liking Final <laughs> Fantasy type games. Like it's going to bring in everybody who doesn't typically play Final Fantasy, and then by the end, all the crazy Final Fantasy stuff happens. <laughs> but it's such like a a, a nice lead in that by by the time it happens everybody's like i love this this is great and i think i think that's a fascinating prospect too it's like we almost had this game that like stayed mostly grounded it would have been mm -hmm. by far the most grounded final fantasy game if they would have followed through with it 
and you can you like you can definitely see like there's a there's a path where like alternate dimension this it splits off and we get this kind of like more political intrigue like final fantasy style story i think that's a very fascinating concept but final fantasy's got a final fantasy and <laughs> that's just the way it's got to be and this is what we ended up with <laughs> yeah which i don't think was a bad thing but yeah like you said there's an alternate dim- like an alternate reality where we got the other version that i also think would have been good just different it would have been the good ending of game of thrones so yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You guys ready to move into spoilers? Absolutely. Let's, go. Let's do it. All right. So we're going to listen to some Final Fantasy 16 music here. And when we come back, it will be full spoilers for Final Fantasy 16. back the gloves are off i i definitely know kind of like the the first thing that i want to just shout out there and that is you mentioned the wolf earlier you mentioned (laughs) torgel (laughs) that dog does get some powers i do like that they kind of you know they magic fight it a little bit but you mentioned killing god that dog is there with you (laughs) through thick and thin killing gods and uh I just thought that was hilarious. I remember uh, the fight against Odin specifically, like towards the end, when you're like up in the sky and like going from like platform to platform and all this stuff. And it's like, how is Torgal keeping up with you? (laughs) And like when you would, you would, you would transform into your like icon form and be jumping all around and and fighting. And then you would go back down to Clive. And then all of a sudden Torgal's right there by you again. It's like, where was he? How did he's he a get good up boy. here? He's a yeah, good he's, boy. He's the goodest boy. But I still, it was just like one of those things where it's like, okay, this game is crazy enough that this is not going to be the thing that breaks my immersion, but it is something that like <laughs> crossed my mind, you know? Torgal's wow. a god. He is. <laughs> Dude, that was, I messaged Eric again when that I happened. I was like, too. how far are you in this game? <laughs> Because something just happened where I was like, I literally, like, when it happened, you know, when Torgal gets his powers, right? yeah. which is such a weird thing to say. Uh, when, I literally had this eventually. moment. Yeah. Yeah. Where he, like, jumps and, like, gets it. And I'm just like, Torgal? Like, what, yeah. like, what just happened? And it just was so out of the blue. And that's one of those Final Fantasy moments, right? Yeah. It was very interesting, the route they went with Torgal and uh, how he was. You know, the surprising thing, too, is, like, People very rarely attacked him. Here you are, like, sicking him on everybody. And the <laughs> monsters are generally just, like, going to stay aggro at you. <laughs> like, they're yeah. just like, get off me, dog. Stop biting me. I'm going to keep <laughs> fighting you, Clive. Um, so, yeah, there is there is a suspension of uh, disbelief there, for sure. We didn't talk about, like, the the accessibility rings um, in the in the main conversation. I thought that was kind of an interesting way to approach, like, difficulty letting you equip these like different rings that would take up a slot for something else but they would like you would do auto combos or you would auto heal or whatever i pretty much always had the one on that like made torgal auto attack (laughs) Mm -hmm. which was really helpful for like (laughs) combat and like keeping the flow of combat moving but it, it did make me remember oh yeah i am playing like a jrpg game because clive is yelling sick him torgal like (laughs) on repeat yeah, every time. Yeah. So there, I'll I'll be honest. There were I didn't have the Torgal ring on, but I mean the combat and I know we touched on the combat a little bit. Um to me, I, I felt like the combat was really engrossing. It was so engrossing to the point where it's like there were large moments in the game where I just like forgot Torgal was there and I'm like, oh yeah, I should probably be like sticking him on people for like a little bit of extra damage. Just totally forgot he was there because I was just like too obsessed of like pulling off my combos and like looking yeah. cool. But yeah, Torgal very quickly, like from the moment he got in the battle with me and then all of a sudden, like, yeah, he's fighting these literal elemental gods and he's just like a wolf. Very quickly penciled him in my book as like one of my favorite video game doggos ever. <laughs> like Torgal is like best boy, ride or die. Like I, I love, I love that little guy. He's, he's great. 
but <sighs> what well, I love yeah. that he made it the whole way through. Like they didn't yes. do the thing where it was oh, like, oh, God. we're, we're going to kill off like, Torgal for that emotional punch. At the end, I'm like, if they fuck, I was like, if they kill Torgal, I'm like, I'm returning yeah. this game. Like I was at that point, I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to deal with it. And you know, he, it's, he's not just like kind of there too. He does have like some very touching, like side quests that you get to do with him. Yeah. Um, he has some very, like, he is very much like a, a friend to Clive and there for Clive, like and he's at his lowest moments and he experiences those low moments with Clive. And I think what kind of endeared him to me immediately is when you have the, the first real icon fight you have is with Benedicta. Yeah. And, you know, she uh, you're like fighting Ugh. her on top of like the tower and she like grabs him, like throws him off. And then like right there, you're like, you think he's dead. Like you're like, she threw him off the tower. So that like I knew that I cared about him right there because I was pissed. I'm like, oh, she did not just throw my dog off the tower. Like I am not pleased with this. And then when he comes back and like bites her and you're like, yeah, like, get her Toro. Like, Saved you twice. Her. Saved yeah, you twice. twice. So yeah. so after that I was I was like yeah Torgal is like ride or die like best boy hands down loved it it may have been crazy the way he powered up but man he stuck he stuck any other lesser dog or, or companion would have left but he fought gods and elemental creatures and stuck through Clive with Clive thin and through thick and thin <laughs> and he was so well integrated into like the community because like Karen would take care of him for you and like she was watching him while. You, you know while you were off um before you came back and like met up with with the the party and then like from the beginning she was jill's dog and so there's like that kind of dynamic between the two clive and jill and then torgal kind of in the middle and so like they just did it, it wasn't just like clive has a dog like they really did a good job right. i felt like of <laughs> of integrating torgal into the the community and making him feel like a, a key character in this game. Yeah, because like whenever you're back at the hideout and like if you're just chilling there, like you can see him. Yeah, he's over with Karen or he's hanging out with some other character that's giving him love. Like he's around, like just interacting with yeah. the people instead of just like, yeah, there are some games out there where like your animal companion is just like not that doesn't get recognized, you know, at all. I understand that not everybody can be at like the level of like Roach who like teleports on top of like houses and stuff. But yeah, yeah, that's like the opposite end of the of the <laughs> right. spectrum when you're talking about companion animals. Oh my but, gosh. Uh, but yeah, I I think, you know, from what everybody can hate if they want, Torgal is fantastic. I love him. Eric, you brought up combos, and um I'm curious how you guys felt about that whole system. Like the combat system and the, the combos themselves. I, I felt like I was doing the same okay. thing. I didn't have the Torgal ring and I was like neglecting my Torgal commands. And I, I did enjoy the combat, and I don't mean this is a bad thing, but I tend I, to find a combo that worked and was very effective and looked cool on top of it, and like that's the combo I used. Yeah, for a majority of the game, like having the icon abilities there to mix it up was really good. Right, it was fun. Like it w was enough to mix up the combat, but um. As far as like when you run across your average enemy that you could take down in one combo, I knew exactly what combo I was going <laughs> to every time. I'm on the same page as Ryan. I thought it was really cool. And really, I, if, with your first playthrough, you're going to find that that combo, that that system of icon abilities that works for you. How many times have you played through this, Eric? That. Uh, I'm on a second playthrough right now. Oh my god! Wow. I'm, playing it on, wow. I, I'm playing. I'm playing it on Final Fantasy mode. Um, okay. Which I don't normally like. I am a wuss. I don't want to play hard games. I don't normally go for the hard difficulty playthrough, but I decided to do that. Um, but yeah, so your first playthrough is you're very much going to find like a, a set of abilities that you feel comfortable with and work for you, and you're going to stick with that. I did that. By the end, I, I think I was running uh, the Phoenix. I was running garuda because with that grab is it's just too clutch with staggers and stuff and then i was running odin because odin is just cool and uh what really happens in when you get to the final fantasy mode and when you start to unlock all the abilities to the point where you can like put them with like different icons that's really where the depth of the combat kind of starts to show because final fantasy mode is is quite difficult and it encourages you to like explore and the abilities for the different icons really do like serve different purposes and they the the heightened difficulty of combat for final fantasy mode i think is where the combat really shines most and this is something that square enix is infamous for too because it's the same criticism that's levied at kingdom hearts where it's just like you can just press square and button your match way for that game but when you crank that difficulty up to to critical or to proud mode 
that's really where the depth, like when when it's nails against the chalkboard, like you're knuckling down and, and playing Square Enix games at their highest level is really where their their combat balancing is showed off. Now, I know that's not like a selling point where it'd be like, well, you'll appreciate the combat if you just play it in the hardest difficulty and bash your head against the wall. That's not a selling point. That you unlock after beating the game. Yeah, that you, and, right. and, and there's not really like enough ability points given to you for your first playthrough to like, master all of the abilities and have that ability to like switch them around so i think in that initial playthrough that's really where the combat like suffers but it does really really shine in that harder difficulty when you have more options available to you and like you're forced to experiment a little bit more because like you're going to get your butt handed to you by certain bosses and you just be like well let me try out some different icon abilities that will maybe stagger them quicker do more damage and, and just kind of it, it encourages that experimentation yeah i used so the 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 icons I settled into was I had the Phoenix stuff, um, like because that maxed out like Phoenix burst move or whatever it was was right. just so awesome really, yeah. to look at. Yeah. And then I had uh, who, what was Sid's icon? The lightning. What was what's his Rama? name? Rama. Yeah. Yeah. So I I used that one, and then super cool. For a while, I was doing the the wind, and then I tried every single icon that i unlocked and some of them i liked more than others obviously and that was what i was talking about kind of in the the spoiler free section was like it's interesting how they dole out these abilities throughout the course of the game because mm -hmm. you don't get odin's power until you're basically at the end of the game and so i put it on because like it was a new way to play the game it's almost completely different from anything you've done up to that point you're trying to like build up that meter to cash it in for like insane damage but i was so far in the game that i had like had my comfortable rotation of like i'm going to switch to these moves to build up the stagger meter really fast and then i'm gonna switch to these moves to like lay down a ton of hurt and do a ton of damage and i was just really comfortable in that and a lot of them were flashy and like the bigger moves and i had some of the like a the equipment equipped that would like give me shorter cooldowns and stuff on some of the moves that I liked. And so that experimentation, like you're talking about, Eric, it really does seem like a second playthrough is where you can really dive into that with your full kind of abilities, like the suite of abilities. Because yeah, it's like some of the stuff you get so late that it's like, yeah, I could try to get proficient with this for this like final boss, or I could just stick to what I've been doing and it's working. And that's kind of what I did. Right, and I'd found by the, by the time I had gotten everything, like you said, you you I feel like, you know, you get Garuda and and Titan and Rama like probably like the first half of the game, and then in the back half you get access to Bahamut, Shiva, and Odin. And by the time I had gotten access to like some of those, some of those, you know, obviously everyone wants to use Bahamut because Bahamut's like the 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 titular summon, and Odin is is just very cool too. By the way, that he that just look at he's fucking Odin on on horseback and a sword. Yeah. But yeah, you get those so late in the game, whereas like I had already invested like so many ability points since like all my other abilities and had it set right. up the way I wanted to. That I was just like, oh, this is really not, you know. Uh, I switched to Odin just because it was it was cool, and I kind of found like a thing that kind of worked with with Titan and some abilities that I had mastered. But yeah, that that second playthrough, you have if you do a new game plus, you have everything available to you from the start. So it's kind of cool to see like oh, these starting areas where I was only limited to like Phoenix and Garuda, now I have like this full array of abilities. Like, what can I do with that? So yeah, it's it's a game that really does the benefit from a second playthrough. But it again, it's a Final Fantasy game. It's a long game. And I just, I don't know if anybody's going to like dive into a second playthrough right away, especially with all the other games we've had this year, like Zelda oh, gosh, and, like, and like Starfields coming out and Baldur's Gate. Like, I just don't, I feel like, I I am playing it slowly but surely on a second playthrough, but nobody's just like diving into a second one all the way through, like back to back. It's not happening. <laughs> I want to talk about my icons real quick. Yeah, for yes. sure. I definitely stuck with Phoenix because, like you said, that Phoenix burst was nuts. And yeah, um, yes. I used Garuda at first, uh, but when I got Shiva, I switched Garuda out for Shiva. That's exactly what I did. Shiva yeah. works that stagger meter like no other icon. You could get someone staggered in like one of Shiva's specials. Uh, and I liked Titan a lot because I yeah. love do like timing the parries and counters with Titan. You could do his like Titan block and get in the counter. And there's also another one of his abilities where if you time it right, it's like a parry and auto counter and it like wrecks other people. So I liked 
like I felt like I was playing punch out with that kind of, you know, it was <laughs> yeah, cool, man. Absolutely. I really liked it for that reason. Yeah. It's interesting how, you know, everybody can kind of have like a different experience because I, I did not vibe with Titan at all. Like I tried him for a, maybe an hour or so. I was just like, nope, I'm going to go back to, uh, to my lightning powers over here. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, the combat was the, and I, I liked how, um, how easy it was to play with it and respec. Like you had to kind of do a little bit of like economy management or whatever with your points and whatever, but like just being able to, all right, I'm going to pull all the points out of this fully upgraded thing over here and I'm going to redistribute them over here to try this for a little while. Yes. Okay. That's not working out. I'm going to pull them back out and move them back over here. No penalties. doesn't cost you more gold or experience points every time you do it or anything like that. Like you can just, do it they want you to play around with all these abilities they want you to try them out they put a lot of effort into them other than the the story and like the the effort they put into the like the world and the the cutscenes and stuff like this you can tell this was the focus of this game and so you would be doing yourself a disservice if you didn't experiment at least a little bit eric you mentioned in the spoiler free section that you had some characters you wanted to call out so (laughs) <laughs> I want to toss it to you to kind of get us going on like the more story spoiler side of things over here. Man, uh, I well, so the one person I was thinking of specifically was was Clive's mother. I don't remember her name, but Ugh. God, I hated her like so much from the beginning. So you find out that yeah. like ultimately she's kind of like behind the events, like the betrayal of of Rosaria, which is where Clive and his family are from, and she kind of like basically betrays her country to like get a higher position of power and she's just very like very just an uh, off like very cersei-esque from like game of thrones right like you just person you hate for the entire thing and she like no redeeming qualities to her character like at all just just awful and she but, comes with yeah, a creepy little kid so yeah it, yeah exactly that like kind of like ties in and be like oh yeah but, like this creepy little kid is actually like god so yeah that was kind of a weird twist that nobody was looking towards but yeah, it, you, there's the game's villains are like very, I felt like very good. Like, yeah, Benedicta, and she's just like very, you, again, you're just like, oh, God, just you know, I was sad to her, see her right? go so quick. I was too. I, I kind of want her to stay around just because she did have that like very like villain. It's like, oh, she's like pulling the strings and like things are going on. And then you have Hugo Kupka, who's uh, the, who is Titan, the, the, his icon is Titan. And he's just like, again, just another just awful, awful human being. And you just, you love to hate him. And, I think that when you have these characters that you hate like so viscerally, uh, it, it makes when you eventually like confront them. So like later in the game, when like Clive goes to like fight Hugo Kuka and leads up to that whole like hour scene where like first where you're first fighting like human form, then it spirals to like his icon fight. Uh, it just feels so good because nothing feels better in a video game than just beating down a villain that's just been been taunting you and just is just a, the most terrible human being that you've ever encountered. So. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if we want to like start going through the story specifically, but yeah, I just I, there wasn't like really like a character in the game that I felt like was bad. I I enjoyed almost all of the characters. Um, Sid is God. Sid is fantastic. Sid He's one was of the best Sid in great. Final Fantasy. And uh, who, but Ralph Emerson, whoever voiced him, is just his voice is like, oh, it's yeah. so like narrate my life. It's like <laughs> so deep and buttery. Oh God, so. Yeah, and Eric like, didn't know what romance was. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> he would say, it, but it wouldn't hurt. I'd be like, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> you know what? You're right. Yeah, no, I, I wanted Hugo Kupka dead as much as all the characters in the game. Like I was that first failed attempt at killing him where you chop off his hands. I was like, oh, yep. man, we didn't Especially get him. Especially after what so... he did to Sid. Yeah, it yeah. was so frustrating to oh, not kill him yeah. there. Yeah. I, all right. So there are a few things now that we're in spoiler territory. Yeah, I want to bring up. Everybody remember that guy uh, in the village who was like, wait until Kupka gets a load of this. <laughs> Do you remember that yes. moment? Is this what one was of the side that? Or... No, it was like the in the quest. main story. You like go okay. back to the village. Uh, you had just stayed with um, your former trainer's uh, uh, widow. That was when you yes. get your Dracula costume, right? Right, yeah, right. It's the Dracula, yeah, yeah the Dracula costume. Exactly. Yep. And yeah. then you like when you come back to that village, it's like overtaken, right? And um there was like a dude hiding behind barrels, like who had this like it was one of the worst voice acted lines ever. <laughs> and he even gives this like, <laughs> like, like a twist of twirling. the mustache. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh dude. I it sticks out to me for some reason. <laughs> and then like they do the whole thing in the story. With uh, the box, right, that's delivered to Hugo Kupka, 
Yeah. Where it's, uh, you can assume it's probably Benedicta's head, right? Yeah. Who sent him that box? Was it Sid? Like, they never resolved it. Right. They never resolved who's, and we know Clive didn't do it, That's right? That's a good point. Yeah. How, did, how did he get that? And, like, Sid probably wouldn't do it. He was very, like, sentimental. So, like, I, this is, goes hand in hand with, like, the intrigue that we were talking about. I thought, oh, man, somebody is, like, setting these two up to, like, go to war, right? And, like, right, yeah. it, using it to their advantage in some way. No, we're just never going to touch on that. We're we'll just, it just happened, guys. <laughs> okay. Like, maybe Benedictus had delivered itself. You don't know. <laughs> Wouldn't be the weirdest thing that happens in that game. <laughs> Maybe it was the it uh, Ultima. You know, he was pulling all the strings. Oh, true. So. Maybe it was Ultima. But, or yeah. or I, I just thought it may be Barnabas, because Barnabas has the interest of, like, having all these people out of his way. Right. Possibly. Could, could have been. Yeah, know. could have been. But you're right. That would have been a perfect moment for, like, an entry where it's like, oh, somebody's setting Hugo and Clive, like, against each other. Like, I wonder what that could be. And it's just like, yeah, that that's one of the intrigue moments that we lose because we transition to the Final Fantasy aspect of the story. Right, right. So, um, yeah, there were just some interesting things. Uh, and I also want to say those blacksmith's quests that you alluded to earlier were phenomenal, dude. I like so how good. the first time they do it, it's a genuine, like, oh, man, like, my craft is it's suffering. I, I've seen true, like, craftsmanship, and I can't live up to it. And then by, like, the fourth one, it's very tongue-in-cheek. It's like, oh, God, this again? Like, are you serious, dude? You have a problem. Like, you're doing <laughs> just fine. You know, they're very, like... <laughs> comical about it like they they take the arc that the player takes right right yeah. when you have to go help the blacksmith again they're very like ah uh, like exasperated about it I, I thought that was pretty cool so the one thing that kind of i guess i even put a, a note down about it when talking about the characters jill and clive they were like the way i read it was that they were on the edge of romance basically through the whole game which to me seemed a little bit weird considering they've been doing this together for years but it's at least the way it seemed to me was that we were supposed to believe that every time they go to kiss or whatever like they get interrupted it's that kind of like oh they never quite can like cross <laughs> the line type of thing and i was like what what is happening because at first i thought they were maybe even just going to stick with the like brother sister type thing of like no we're you know we're platonic like she's we're just partners in this, but then they did start to like lean into like the more flirting and that kind of thing. But then it was like, you have a time jump in this game after Sid dies. And it's like the amount of time that we've jumped, like look how much longer Clive's hair has gotten and look at his, his like stubble is like more stubble. It was like now. a five year, five year time jump. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, we're still supposed to believe that they're still just kind of like flirting with each other and haven't gotten to kiss yet. Or then maybe I thought, well now maybe the romance and all that happened in the jump. But then it seemed like, no, the, the moment came when, you know, like she gives him her powers. And I was just kind of like that, that felt like the most awkwardly paced, like relationship between characters in the whole game to me. I'm not sure if you guys read it the same or if I maybe misinterpreted or missed some things, but that was one that stuck out to me. Yeah, I mean, when you I, and I'll take this question because we know Eric doesn't know about it. <laughs> it's true. So, no I'm kidding. I'm totally joking. Eric. I Savage. have a different aspect of Jill I want to talk about, so I'll go after you. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, when they, when you consider the time jump, absolutely, it seems a little odd. I think they say something after the time jump too, how they've bo both been so busy like doing things for um. God, what's the name of their crew? I can't remember what they call it. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, they're a little like alliance, right? I want to say like um, the second yeah. sons or something, but that's from Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the golden company. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, so I think there is, and like I kind of read as like that was um, almost like their explanation for it, right? Was like, oh, you've both been so busy with these things and that's why it hasn't happened yet. Um, I knew it was kind of an inevitability though. It, it, it was always kind of painted that way and addressed that way. So uh, it wasn't a focal point of the game for me when it happened. I, I think the most interesting thing is that it showed this transfer of iconic abilities doesn't have to be a painful thing. Because up until that point, it was always depicted as the person who the abilities were being taken from is being in pain from it. But there were a few times in the game when the person gave it willingly and it was yeah. not 
like a, a, a painful experience. And I thought that was kind of neat to to show the the differences there. But yeah, I mean, it, it didn't surprise me. Uh, it wasn't necessarily handled well. It was a little clumsy, but you know, it is what it is, right? Not uh, not focusing too much on the romance aspect because I can't pick up <laughs> on those things. But uh, I personally, I found I found Jill's character very compelling. I liked her to, just as a character. Yeah, I liked her a lot. Yes, and I, I think she had a very convincing arc compared to like how you know a lot of female protagonists are still treated in video games these days. Her and Clive's relationship is obviously a very important aspect of each of their their characters. Um, I especially like and kind of around like the midpoint of the game too, where like. Jill is like committing to helping Clive with like Sid's endeavor to like change the world or whatever. And the, the game gives Clive like every opportunity to like redeem himself and come to terms with his past and like, you know, get past the, the, the trauma that he had uh, at the start of the game when he like, you know, he ultimately turns into Ifrit for the first time and, and kills his brother, Joshua. Uh, and he has uh, the game devotes ample amount of time to like him coming to terms with that. But, you know, when you re, connect with Jill at the start of the game, like after the events of the demo, uh, like Jill has also suffered a lot from that event too. Mm -hmm. You know, she was, she was captured by the iron born or iron lads, whatever they were called. And <laughs> iron lads. Uh, that's yeah. when she, the like, Greyjoys. Yeah. Yes. The Greyjoys. Right. And, uh, basically that's when she became Shiva. They found out that she was the, the dominant of, of ice. And, and she went through a lot of trauma at their hands because their society was very much like magic as taboo and, and dominance are like these like freaks of nature and stuff. So she went through a lot of, like trauma and stuff. And one of the things like when she was like committing to like joining Clive in his quest, she was like, Hey, like when we go to destroy the mother crystal, like I need to like square away my past with like these people and like get not like revenge, but like, you know, close the door on that and like face it head on and kind of face my trauma type of thing. And they, and they allowed her the, the, the story arc and the space to do that in the game, which I was like, yeah, there are other games that obviously wouldn't have done that. And it was very convincing. And I felt very like happy for her that she got that, closure with like her story arc and on her trauma and then from there yeah we have like kind of like this weird romance between her and clive was like will they won't they culminating on that scene on the beach which is was is a very touching scene uh kind of <laughs> caught off guard when first time so I'm like, <laughs> yeah oh we're naked we're naked on the beach now cool that's that's happening yeah it, it is a very much like oh there's comical like timing of like oh we we're about to kiss but we got interrupted um the the, the most interesting thing to me is that like jill is such an important part of clive's character and it's very obvious is that they shelved her for the finale of the game and that's mm -hmm. kind of where i was they were kind of like oh, okay like she served her purpose like her and clive are in love now now clive and dion and joshua are off to go and confront ultima but jill's gonna stay there and i'm like well you know i understand from story points like why she did that she gave her power to clive like i understand that but i feel like she's such an important part of Clive's story that I just didn't want her to be like, be like shelved like that. Like she should have had something to do with like that final conflict. Cause she worked just as hard as Clive to like mm -hmm. fulfill Sid's vision and like, and like save the world. And they just kind of like, she, they're like, Oh, just stay here and watch Torgal. Like that's what you're going to do. And the, the men will go handle, handle Ultima. So and they built know, her felt, character as someone who wouldn't sit there that. for that. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. So I thought that was a little strange. Yeah, I guess like the only maybe um, benefit of the doubt or something you could say is like they wanted to leave her behind in case they failed. She could try her best to take care of, you know, the also true, the the people that they left behind. But also if they failed, it was kind of like the end of the world. Like they knew this was yes. this was it. So it's basically all or nothing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I don't remember. How did Clive get Dion's power? Um, I think it was, I think he absorbed some of it after the Bahamut fight, didn't he? Cause yeah. Yeah. they, they, they fought him at the Capitol, which by the way, awesome. uh, I think, I think, yeah, I think I messaged Ryan. I'm like, tell me when you get to this part. And Ryan did. And we were just like, yo, we just fought Bahamut like in outer space for like 20 minutes. Like how freaking like a, yeah. apart from any problem you might have with this game, like, how can you not like that's peak video game right there? Like, how can you not love that? Um, yeah, I think it was at that moment or it, it, he, he took some of it and it was implied too that like, just cause you take a little bit of their power doesn't mean like they lose their, and that's a little bit fuzzy too. Right. That like, was what I was going to say is it kind Jill of fuzzy. loses her power, but like, and like Clive takes some of Bahamas power, but like Dion still has his powers. Yeah. And so Kuka yeah, this, still had his powers. Benedict you, did the same thing too. Yeah. But then they also so, like gave in to like whatever primal energy when you fight them, like after true. you take their power. So 
they like gave it to that yeah to get like super powered um which dion didn't do he just went no he didn't he just went and fought alongside you which i mean that was man i mean that's kind of i guess where i want to go next is like these icon battles they open up strong like you just (laughs) fighting as phoenix and stuff in the beginning of the game and then every one is unique and special it like it didn't feel like, oh, we're doing the icon battle again. It was like, no, each one is its own dedicated set piece built uniquely for these characters. And yeah, you said it, Eric, like peak video game. This was like, this is the stuff that like these, (laughs) Mm -hmm. this is why we play video games. Like sure. Some of them may not have been like mechanically deep or anything like that, but just the spectacle and the fact that I was included pushing the buttons and like moving the stick and stuff. Like it was incredible. It was like, probably even more impressive than some of like the god of war moments where like you have like these huge things on screen that you're fighting and taking down like this was it was like the crown jewel of this experience you know mm-hmm. yeah they made them, yeah they made them all unique too which was yeah really, like you, you could have just easily had like oh six identical like giant kaiju battles exactly um but yeah just thinking about all the different ones like yeah the battle with bahamut like joshua was involved and like you're literally in outer space and then like the oh, battle against like join up too and you yeah get that, like so they literally cool. have a screenshot moment where you get like the phoenix and ifrit mix and they're just like Rah! they knew right. what they were doing dude they yeah. do that that fusion dance from dragon Ball. exactly like, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's fucking great and then the, the the point where i was just like this is going to keep getting more hype every single battle was like the one with kupka where it's like you know, you, you fight him a couple times in human form and then like you're fighting him like underground and then like all of a sudden you're like fighting a giant, you're fighting a whole mountain and you're just like running up the side of this mountain while they're like rock tendrils flying all over the place. Yeah, you they're look all, tiny like, so... in comparison and yes, not which small. is shocking. Yeah, yeah, no, which is shocking. And then I think kind of really where they did a good job of it was the Odin fight in particular where it was like Barnabas and Clive were like, switching back and forth between like like one moment they'd be fighting as odin and ifrit and then the next moment they'd be back like fighting as people and they kind of like shift back and forth like that it's just yeah every single fight was unique and there were always moments during those fights where you just felt like it can't get any more hype than this and then it gets just gets a little more like like the developers knew that their fight was exciting they're just like we just crank it up like a little bit more just to, to take it just over the top Oh, I can't say enough good things about the Icon fights. They're so cool. They're so cool. So unfortunately, Ryan had some internet problems where his internet just decided to not work. So we have lost him, at least for the time being, probably for the rest of the episode. I've asked him to write me with his verdict and his final thoughts. So I will read those out when we get to that part of the episode, if he is able to do that. Uh, In the meantime, Eric is still here with me. We're still in spoilers. We are uh, talking about icon battles. Uh, was there anything else that you wanted to uh, say regarding the icon battles? Nope. Uh, if you let me keep going, I'd probably just say they're cool a, f- a, f- a thousand more times. So. They they are a thousand that's times all, cool. I so <laughs> it's definitely I understand why. But uh, kind of I guess maybe the last thing that I feel like we really have to touch on in this section is the ending. We've referenced it a few times. Uh, Killing God, like Ultima. We've mention that name there is this higher power being that is kind of pulling the strings and causing the blight and you learn in a lot of exposition towards the end like what his deal is and uh then you have to kill him at the end and it is i don't know like a three hour boss fight or something like (laughs) the, the different phases and things that you have to do um very long (laughs) so so what did you think like kick us off talking about this this ending section yeah so ultima i guess basically his deal is like like you said he's he's a higher power and he is and his race is is basically responsible for like the creation of of the humans right um and they were trying to solve this problem where like the blight was like destroying their world and they were trying to figure out 
how to stop that from happening. The blight just basically just chars the land, makes it unlivable. Yeah. And so this kind of ties back into like all the other things, uh, uh, just a bunch of story stuff that we we didn't have time to cover. And like the, you heard us mention the mother crystals, which were like this, this thing they were using to like gather magical energy so they could like basically cast a spell and like kill everybody, but also like stop the blight and bring back Ultima's race of people, whoever they were. It's like I said, very final fantasy yeah. stuff, right? Like all, all that. Um, and the main crux of the game is is like Ultima believes that like humans are like ruining his plan because like they have free will and he wants to eradicate free will. And like Clive is like the antithesis of that. He's like free will is like what makes humans special. And like even if they make mistakes and are ruining the earth and killing each other, they still deserve the right to like choose for themselves. So it's like we're dealing with a lot of classic Final Fantasy tropes in here. As far as like Ultima is a villain, it's very like kind of standard like RPG god higher being stuff I, I don't think he's like as iconic as like your sephiroth or your, or your kafka's or or anything like that like nobody like 20 years from now is gonna be like man iconic final fantasy villain ultima i just i don't think so um but for what he stands for and kind of the themes that the game is telling you i think he's i think he's fine yeah like you said the the final battle against him is very long and is a again a gigantic spectacle but uh, uh, yeah he's he's not on the level of like your your sephiroth's or or some of the more iconic Final Fantasy villains. Yeah, and it kind of felt like he was this unknown for so long in the game that then in like the last quarter, all of a sudden he was a real presence and like you knew what his deal was. I thought that that kind of ramped up pretty quickly. Right. But like you said, he served his purpose and I think he did a good enough job. And I think really what what sold it and what made the ending so impactful was like the performances of joshua and clive and dion and all the people involved in like the final fight and like because you know classic jrpg stuff they're yelling back and forth at each other arguing about their <laughs> ideals and about like the power of friendship and all this kind of stuff and like you know what it means to be human and so i think that the the performance is something we we haven't really touched on too much either like the the performances and the, and the actors in this game were were incredible, and I think it it helped sell this like emotionally impactful ending. And then yeah, on the flip side, just the spectacle of it, like you fight as Clive a few times, like the man, then you fight as icons, and then you get to like do a group battle with Clive and Joshua and Dion in their icon forms, and it's just like it just keeps ratcheting up the the spectacle and the intensity and i thought it was a, a really strong and impactful way to to finish up the game and then it kind of ends on like a, a melancholy note once clive has served his purpose he he dies like his body can't take it anymore and he moves on yeah he ends up turning to like he ends up petrifying which is like when we talk about bears and stuff that one of the side effects of like using magic is that it like slowly petrifies your body over time. Again, one of like there's there's so much lore. Like we could just do a, a whole separate episode about like all the lore and, and stuff in, in the story of this game. But yeah, after he basically like stops Ultima and destroys like the giant crystal he's going to use to like save the Earth. But realistically, he wants to kill everybody. Yeah, Clive is like laying on the beach just slowly petrifying while the lay the waves like kind of lap around him and he's looking at the moon because one of the things that him and jill did was like watch the moon together like that was one of the things that they did and that happens in a couple scenes over the course of their entire life and he's like can you see the moon too too jill and he just like petrifies and and dies and i think we even get like a scene of her yeah like that she knows she like she knows that yeah she can feel gone. it yeah yeah, um, which I, I'm i fine with. I think that, you know, they could have played it safe and had Clive come back and just been like happily ever after him and Jill live together in this like new world that they get to build. But I, I, you know, I think I like this ending. I think that don't play it safe. And yeah, I I, I, I like the ending. I, I like the way everything pretty much wraps up and resolves itself. I don't really have any issues with that. It also canonically makes sense when you see how how much Joshua is struggling with with his powers and when right you know how much Jill is struggling with hers and it's like making them sick and then you see all the people just the regular um bearers and stuff that if they're they're pushed too hard using their powers by like their masters they start to get this like petrification illness and ultimately die and so it makes sense that 
Clive being able to wield the powers of every icon that it would take a toll right. on his body, especially, I guess, like when he t- kills Ultima, Ultima was kind of the thing that was holding him together because Ultima wanted to use him as his vessel. So right. it it was like a, a suicide mission, essentially. Like once he removed Ultima from the picture, that was the thing that was allowing him to be essentially immortal under the pressure of like all these different icons in his body. And then once that was gone, like it was just too much. And, and that kind of transitions into the end of the game too. So after all this happens and the crystals are all destroyed, like magic is basically gone from the world. And we get a, a scene at the end. I don't remember if it's like exactly like right after the credits or just like right before or whatever, but we get a scene of like these two boys, like playing in a house and like a mother. It, it, it seems to be like this world where like magic isn't present and, the boys go outside to play and like the camera pans over and and sitting on a desk is is a book and on the, the title of the book is called Final Fantasy by by Joshua Rossfield. Yeah. And so I, I kind of like that ambiguous ending because that can mean a couple of things like we're led to believe that Joshua dies in the final battle. But with like the Phoenix powers, he's come back to life before like that's the Phoenix's whole thing. So like he either could have like come back to life and like written the book and it could have been like handed down over generations and, like this new world that they're building. Or the whole thing could have just been like a story in this book to begin with, and like none of it was real. Like the like you know Adam Sandler and Click, it was just all a dream. Yeah, don't know. Kind of kind of open to interpretation, but that's the way they decided to to end it. And I, I kind of like how like just poetic that is because the the classic Final Fantasy theme is playing, and you know this is a new direction for the the series, and just to kind of have I just I kind of like just the symbolism how how poetic that ending was yeah a very like kind of tasteful and artistic way to like like you said leave it open to interpretation you know just a little bit in in not a way that like i guess ultimately matters unless they want to do like a sequel to this game but in a way that like it lets you it lets you kind of put your own headcanon twist on it you know and maybe you know someday they'll come out and say what what actually what it meant but yeah, that that's true. I think that I think that was like the post credits thing. But I remember that. I I didn't really think about it until you mentioned it, and then it all came flooding back. I was like, oh yeah, right, right, right. And I think like and like you said too. There, as far as I understand, there's there's no intention for any kind of like DLC or story extension or anything else around this game. So that's what Yoshida had said. Uh, I'm sure if this game makes enough money, they'll they'll find a way to do something. I, I joked on social media that I would love like a, a, a Sid based DLC kind of maybe following some of his adventures. I yeah. thought that would be really, really cool. I'm sure there's things they can do with it, but like for now, this is, this is what the game is. So, I mean, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. That's interesting that they, they don't want to do maybe some of that stems from uh 15 and what a, what a kind of a disaster <laughs> that was with all of its patches and DLCs and stuff like that. But yeah. Nice. Absolutely. So is there anything else you want to make sure that we cover or that we uh, mention in the spoiler section? Like you said, like we probably could have done a whole mini series on this game. Like it's, it's tough to fit it all into a couple hours, but I think we've, we've hit on some of the, like the biggest and most important aspects. And then we've hit on just some of the stuff that like stuck out to us and that we're passionate about, which I think is equally as important. But is there anything else that you wanted to, to mention before we move out of spoilers and into our verdicts? Uh, not really anything I can think of off the top of my head. I think that it, it it is a Final Fantasy game. So just by that aspect, there's always division. There's always a lot of a lot of feelings uh, attached to when Final Fantasy games come out. And uh, I kind of felt when I finished the game that I was in the minority because I I came out of the game really really loving it, and I feel like the the reception to the game was more mixed within within our community and on the internet at, at large. Yeah. And I, and I think that, like I said, that's just your your perception of what Final Fantasy is is going to depend on where you entered the series and like what Final Fantasy means to you. There's no set definition as to what exactly is Final Fantasy. Ultimately, it says Final Fantasy on the box, so it's it's Final Fantasy. But I came out of this game. I I really loved it. I think this is. Well, I guess I should say that my say that for my verdict, right? But I I think. There's a lot of conversation around it, but don't. I, I if you're even remotely curious, I would just encourage you to 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 try it. At least try the demo. Yeah, I mean, you can try the demo; it's free. And um, yeah, just I, I think it's definitely worth. There's never been a better time or easier time to get into Final Fantasy than now. I think. Yeah, and I I don't think you're gonna play another game like this, and so it's definitely no. worth 
if the subject matter seems interesting, if the combat seems interesting, like it's definitely worth checking out. Uh, you know, maybe wait for a sale if, if the price tag's a little too high. But I definitely, I would encourage basically anybody that likes video games to check this game out. Um, and then, you know, touching on what you're saying about like kind of the discourse, it's something that we talk about on this show a lot is just like, just because there's a vocal group on the internet doesn't mean that that's the majority of, of players. Like they're, right. the game in general was positively received like by critics and I, I think, you know, most fans. And so I, it's not perfect. I definitely think that criticism is like, it's not wrong to criticize the things that you wish were, were different or could be improved, but agreed. Also, just because there's some loud people on the internet saying that it sucks doesn't mean that it does. So, <laughs> Also true. All right, well, let's go ahead and leave spoilers behind and roll into our verdicts for Final Fantasy XVI. that we rate games on this show and on our youtube channel is we use the classic uh letter grade scale uh, also the classic like video game ranking scale which is your typical like a through f but also there is s which is above a that is masterpiece that is like god tier that's the best it can be ryan was kind enough to send me a little blurb uh with his ranking so we'll start with that i'll read that and we'll go from there so Ryan said, Final Fantasy 16 is a solid B. This game does some incredible things in the way of spectacle, but it is also very imbalanced. It is also a very imbalanced game when it comes to pacing. As a whole, I enjoyed my time with it, and I truly believe there's a lot to love with this title. So I think that's uh, it's accurate. It's succinct. I, I agree with, with that uh, ranking. Eric, as the Square Enix apologist and the... <laughs> super fan of final fantasy first of all i'm curious to hear your verdict but also i want you to know that this is a subjective ranking this is how you feel about this game so don't feel pressured to like pick a ranking based on like well you know i feel it's this way but because of this this and this i'll get no like tell us what your what what, what it is in your heart uh i think just kind of in general you know, one of the one of the most difficult questions I ever get asked when I do podcast stuff or have Q&A's or stuff and people, you know, always ask, well, what are your top five games? But people always ask me, like, what are the games that you hated playing? And I don't really have an easy answer for that, because most of the times I'm generally positive on I, I can't think of there's maybe only a handful of gaming experiences over my entire life where I was just like, that was awful, not worth it. I'm, I'm generally pretty positive overall. Yeah. When it comes to the games that I play and when it comes to Square Enix games, I, I'm pretty irrational in my, in my love for them because just because they're, they're so important to me s tier being like masterpiece like perfect e even amongst like my top 10 top 25 games i would say maybe only two or three i would consider s tier masterpieces like those are very few and far between yeah. i would give this uh hands down an a i think this game is fantastic even with all of its flaws of things that can be improved it is the after the questionable experiences that we got with Final Fantasy 13 and 15, what those games tried to do. And even I'd, I'd, and amongst those games, I, I fall a little bit more positive on those than other people do. Right. Uh, I, th I think in, in terms of Final Fantasy in the 2000s, um, the last couple of decades, this is the best Final Fantasy uh, since Final Fantasy 9. That's including 10, that's including 12, uh, the online ones. Uh, this is the best Final Fantasy experience of the last... 20 years, I appreciate all the things that try to do. I under, I'm understanding of trying to reach a new audience. I think the thing that is the most impressive thing about this game is, you know, like I said, Naoki Yoshida said they set out to make a completed product. They had no intentions of piecemealing it out like Final Fantasy 15 or building this entire narrative universe around it like Final Fantasy 13. They set out to make a game that was narratively complete and they did that. And I think it's a very impressive package. I think it's a 
positive new direction for a series that is going on 30, mid 30, almost 40 years old at this point. And I would encourage anybody who's even remotely Final Fantasy uh, or interested in Final Fantasy to to play it. Uh, and this is coming from, you know, me, the massive Kingdom Hearts fan, the massive Square apologist. I love this game. I look forward to playing it many more times for for years to come. And yeah, unapologetically, the best Final Fantasy experience in the 2000s, hands down. Sorry, people that love 10. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's my verdict. No, that's awesome. Really, really well said. I, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm glad that we had you on this episode for sure. Uh, I love hearing from, from passionate fans about, <laughs> about games. For me, I'm basically right in line with Ryan. Um, you know, I, I would give this a very strong B. I think that there are a few things, you know, that hold it back just as far as like pacing. And, you know, we talked about some of the up and down with like the, the quality and the animations and things like that. But none of that like really took away from the core experience, which I thought was fantastic. And like I mentioned, uh, towards the end of the spoiler section, if you didn't listen to that is if you're at all interested in like the subject matter of this game or final fantasy at all like you mentioned like this is a great one to try i think that anybody who likes video games should give this game a shot and i think that there is something there that you will potentially like or love or enjoy so i i definitely i had a great great time with this game and i would i would definitely recommend it I, I think too we're I, we're supposed to get the the second part of the Final Fantasy VII remake this year. So between that and sixteen, I, this is a great year for to be a Final Fantasy fan to experience Final Fantasy. So yes, between between those two games, and just so everyone in your audience knows where I fall on this, you know, I played this after I played Zelda, and currently in terms of game of the year stuff, I have this ranked higher than Zelda. Oh so. wow, okay. Just see, just so everyone understands where I'm at, but I am irrational. So no, I mean. <laughs> Sometimes, I mean, there's a good chance that that's going to be Spider-Man for me just because I'm irrational about, you know. I forgot we have Spider-Man coming too. Uh, My goodness. What a great year for games, man. So good. So good. <laughs> so this is the part of the show where I want my guests to plug their stuff. Since Ryan is not here, I will encourage everybody to please go check out the List Off podcast. It's a great time. He and his co-host, Brian, just talking about the stuff that they love in a hobby that they enjoy. And they did a bit of a rebrand. So if you listen to our interview that we did with Ryan a while back, um, they were still doing like the list based thing. Uh, they've, they went away for a little while. We had a really touching tribute for them and then they came back from the dead and, uh, <laughs> and now they're back and they're putting out great content. It's a little bit shorter. It's a little more casual, but it's definitely worth checking out. Um, so I would definitely encourage everybody to check them out. I will have a link to their podcast uh, in the description. I think they probably have a link tree, so I'll grab that. And uh, yeah, for sure. Everybody go go check out the List Off podcast. Eric, I'm going to let you shill your own stuff because you're still here. So tell everybody about <laughs> the Unlockables and, and what you got going on over there. So uh, yes, my name is Eric. I host the Unlockables podcast. I build as the story of video games, the people who play them, and the memories made along the way. And uh, I kind of have a, a wide variety of topics on mine. I, I have a lot of podcast creators in the video game space on to tell me about their shows. Um, Andrew and Dylan have come on here, and they've come on here for an uh, episode on Majesty, which was a, a lot of fun, one of my favorite episodes I've ever done. And um, I, I, I've been, I, I kind of switched from a, a weekly release schedule to kind of like a, a twice a month type of thing. And I'm doing more like essay pieces on just kind of like, I'm I'm really focusing on that element of like telling the story of of video games and uh, my Kingdom Hearts series guiding keys has kind of like led the way on that where I'm doing like a really deep dive into like the games the story they're telling the context around their development so really kind of focusing on that and I'll be doing that style of breakdown for for more games in the future once I finish playing those um yeah bulk of my uh, bulk of my episodes talking about games are focused on like Square Enix and stuff. So if you have any interest in that, uh, come check it out. You can find all my socials, the show, uh, linktr.ee forward slash unlockables podcast. And since I've switched to like a twice a month or kind of whenever I can get episodes out type of schedule, uh, I've been posting a lot more on TikTok, uh, some like short, like minute, two minute videos where I just kind of talk about things I wouldn't normally have time to or just our shorter form stuff that I wouldn't talk about in my show. Uh, just kind of stuff that's going on in the gaming sphere um, and just stuff like that. So and that's been 
dabbling a little bit more with the short form video content has been pretty cool. So uh, go check me out on TikTok uh, at Unlockables Pod. That's been really fun. So yeah, that's where you can find me. Follow me on social. Uh, say hey. You know, tell me my opinions are bad. I don't care. I love interacting with anybody that listens to the show and, and our community is a great little community here. So yeah, for sure. I think what you're doing on your show is is really cool. It's uh, you know, there's a lot obviously, and there's nothing wrong with this, but a lot of like news based podcasts or people that do what we do, kind of like just talking about the games that they're actively playing. Uh, which obviously you are replaying Kingdom Hearts when you go through it and do your deep dives, but like picking a series and then just like breaking it down to the level of like research that you're doing, I I think that's really impressive. It's really cool. So I think everybody should definitely go check out the Unlockables podcast. Check out Eric on on uh, TikTok. We'll have all those links in the description and on our website, so it'll be really easy to find. Thanks, man, for coming on. This has been a lot of fun. No problem. Thank you for for having me on, Andrew. I really appreciate it and allowing me to bring my zany, insane passion for for Square and Final Fantasy onto your show. No, it was it was perfect. And the only the only bad thing was that we lost Ryan, but definitely shout out to yes. him. Appreciate him coming on too. These things happen sometimes. That's just the world we live in. No big deal. But it was it was good that we had him for as long as we did. I definitely appreciate him coming on as well. Uh, as far as friendly neighborhood gamers, if you're not following us on YouTube, we would greatly appreciate it if you went to YouTube and checked us out. We're, uh, I feel like we're kind of finding our footing and catching a bit of a stride over there. So if you want to support us on YouTube, that would that would mean a lot for the podcast. You know, leaving a, a rating, a review, those kind of things helps a lot. Telling a friend helps a lot. If you've got another nerdy friend that enjoys video game conversations, or for this episode specifically, Final Fantasy, like tell somebody about it. It, it helps us grow our audience in a in an organic tangible way when sometimes you know we don't know if posting things to instagram is really doing all that much but <laughs> with all that being said uh thank you to my guests ryan and eric and thank you everybody who has listened and gotten this far in the episode we genuinely appreciate it uh and with all that being said we will catch you on the next one We hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of the Friendly Neighborhood Gamers podcast. If so, we would greatly appreciate your help in growing the show and the community by giving us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and any other podcasting app that allows it. We also have some great videos on our YouTube channel, including reviews, rankings, and other topics. We would really appreciate you checking it out. And if you want to keep up with everything going on in the neighborhood, follow us on Instagram and Twitter, and feel free to jump in our Discord server. We hope to see you there. Links for everything are in the podcast description. Thanks again for listening, and remember, stay, stay friendly, friendly, gamers. gamers.